Verse 5, uh, John says, those who know him yet do not keep his commandments is a liar. And uh, that's in verse 4. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. We, we want to be in him. And to be in him is a, by obedience to the gospel. And then by baptism for the remission of our sins, we come up out of the watery grave and we're now in him. But then we are to live a faithful life to him uh, for the rest of our life so that we'll have that crown. And now he's telling us whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been truly perfected. And then he look at that, what he says next. By this we know that we are in him and we all want to be in him. Uh, so those who keep his word, it's the same as saying keeping his commandments. It's the very same thing. So when we strive to do this in our lives, our love for God is strengthened each day in our life as a Christian, and his love is being perfected or manifest in us. In other words, when it's manifest in us, what does that mean? I need to move this down. When, when his love is manifested in our life, what does manifested mean? It, it, it's shown, isn't it? It's, it's part of our life. And it's, it becomes obvious to anyone who, who meets us and sees us each and every day because our life is being manifested in God. Uh, we are Christ-like. And so that's, that's the goal for us each and every day of our life. Our life, our love for God is strengthened in this life. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but I can, even without my ears in. <laughs> So when we strive to do this in our lives, our love for God is strengthened uh, in our life each and every day. The, the love of God is perfected. It's manifested in us. People can tell that we are Christ-like. Uh, keeping His Word, it, it, it also is a close, it, it indicates a close relationship that we have with our Master, our Savior. Uh, it's the blessings that we have available to us. It's a close, intimate relationship with God. And the result of this relationship with God and His Son is we become fruit-bearing by that close relationship. That's why we are to be fruit-bearing Christians. Um, John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. We'll be back to 1 John here in just a second, chapter 2. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, Jesus tells us, Abide in me, and I in you. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are what? The branches. We are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, what, is, what happens? He bears much fruit. For apart from me, he says, what can we do? Nothing. <laughs> we can do nothing apart from him. So now we're in, we're in verse 6. Any comments? Or anybody want to add to that? We're now in verse 6, where we left off. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now he's talking to us as Christians, how we are to walk. So a person who says, I abide in the Lord, what is he to do? How do you know? Because we walk that way. We walk in the way in our lives. We walk in that way in our lives as the way He wants us to walk. To walk as the Lord walked. To be Christ-like. In other words, we're to walk in the light. As a Christian, we're to be in fellowship with God and Jesus Christ. By keeping 
his commandments. To walk as Christ walked. Well, you couldn't have a more perfect example. You just can't. He is the perfect example of this, to walk as he walked. And we're to follow the example that he gave us. So I want to review, just mention what we've talked about so far. Not review, not go back. I, I will in a way, but, but I'm just going to sum it up. What we've studied so far in, in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he tells us that he is our advocate. He represents us in heaven. And, and also... He is the perpetuation for our sins. In other words, He's the atoning sacrifice. He died for you and I. So that's what He talks about in verse 1 and 2. Verse 3, By this we know if we keep His commandments, if we know Him. So that's how we can tell we are in Him and we want to be in Him, but we must keep His commandments. Verse 5, Keeping His word, what happens to us? His love is perfected in us. Isn't that wonderful? By doing what He says, by keeping His Word, then the love He has for us is perfected in us. I want you to think about His love. It's hard for us to understand completely, isn't it? The love that He has for us, that God's love, that He's willing to, to send His Son to this earth to make a sacrifice for us, a one-time sacrifice, so that he can bring us or reconcile us back to God. It's hard to understand. We don't deserve that, do we? Do we deserve that? Did you raise your hand? No, I guess not. No, we don't deserve that, do we? But that's his love. That's the kind of love he has for us. So in verse 6 he says, and sum it up by saying, we abide in Him. In other words, we walk in the same manner as He walked. We walk according to His will in our lives. Now we're ready for verse 7. Anybody have anything you want to add? Verse 7, if you don't. Verse 7. Beloved, or beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you. Uh huh. But an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. John tells us in this letter that even the old law commanded us to love God, didn't it? Remember Abraham? He walked with God. He obeyed God. God showed him where he was going at 75 years old, and he left his home and his families, and he took his family, and he went and traveled to a place he didn't even know where he was going, but he had what in God? He had faith in God, and he walked as God wanted him to do. Uh, <clears throat> so even in the old law, John says, this isn't a new commandment. As Christians, this wasn't new either. They were aware of their obligation to the Lord to love, the, to love God, and they possessed it in their beginning, and as soon as they became a Christian, as soon as they came out of that watery grave, they possessed this. And it was the beginning of what kind of walk as a new Christian? A walk with God. That's what their life became. That's what each one of us, when we became a Christian, that's what our life became. It became walking in the light walking in a Christian life. And that walk is grounded by the love of God. Uh, we have an obligation, and we have to be aware of our obligation. As Christians, this, this wasn't new, uh, he's saying, because Christians are aware of our obligation to love God. And, they, and we possessed it from the beginning of our Christian walk. Uh, this walk is grounded upon the love of God. And it has always been a commandment from God. Always. Remember David? What, did, what was unusual about David? Do you remember what, what was said about David? That, that we need ourselves? Do you remember what David had? He was a man after God's own heart. 
Wow. <laughs> wow. This commandment is a, that he's given us to walk in the light, to be a, an example in our life. This is essential for us as a Christian. It's essential for salvation. And we learned it from the beginning of our new life in Christ. This was a commandment under the new covenant that we live under. This is how, and, and we hear it preached in the gospel. This is how they received it. They received it, and this is how we receive it. This love for God is in the Word of God. We're told by the Word of God. Verse 8. On the other hand, he says, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So the commandment to love God is as old as man. I mean, it's as old as man since creation. But in another sense, it's always been new. Isn't that and let me, let me explain that the <laughs> best I can. Because when we walk as a Christian, when we are Christ-like in our life, he's, we're complying with an old commandment, but in a sense it's always new because we're new as a Christian. <clears throat> that makes sense? I, I don't know if that makes sense, but... Every day it becomes new, doesn't it, in our life? Thank you. That's, that's the word I was looking for. Great job. So it complies. We comply with an old commandment that is new every day. Uh, if you want to turn here and read this, if you don't, just listen. Micah 6 and verse 8. Well, that's a wonderful, I tell you, I love that verse. <laughs> Micah 6 and verse 8. Here's what that says. Micah 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, what a verse. That applies to us in our lives. Micah 6 and verse 8. Walk humbly with your God. So the love of God is as old as mankind. I mean, it becomes new with each experience of a new Christian. And also it's new in our condition and our discipleship as, as a follower, the follower of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, if John chapter 13 explains it a lot better than I do. The Lord does a great job. He always does with the flimsy old me. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, if we do, look what happens. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now let me ask you, is that easy? Is that easy? Are we tempted sometimes to say, oh, I hate them. I hate that guy. Are we tempted to do that? We are, aren't we? And, and until we catch ourselves and we go, wait, wait a minute, I, I, don't, I better not say that. Because that's, that's not the way we are to be. Um, we're to love. And that's a, that's a real challenge for us as a Christian. It's to love one another. It, but if we want to be his disciple, if we want a home in heaven, that's our goal. If you have love for one another, that's each other, each one of us. That is for anyone we meet. And that's a real challenge sometimes. Verse 9. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother, where is he? He's in darkness. He's in darkness. Listen, I have been in situations in my life, in the army, in teaching, 
in disasters, I, a lot of things that I have done, and I have been guilty of saying before I stop to think about this, I would say, man, I cannot stand that guy. I, 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 I have been guilty of that, and I have to stop and stop and think of just what did I just say? Because if we say we're walking in the light, but yet we hate our brother, we're walking in darkness. Will the darkness save us? No, we're not going to make it. <laughs> and we want to make it. That, that we're, if, we're, if we have that on our heart, then we're still walking in the darkness. And, and, and that's not where we want to be. So John just gave us this example. If a person says he's in the light, but he hates his brother and sister in Christ, or uh, anybody, I would say, he's still in darkness. He's not walking in the light. And we're to walk in the light. We're to, we're to reflect the light of Jesus Christ in our life so that Jesus can be seen in our lives. Christ-like. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an agape love, isn't it? It's a love that God has for their soul, right? Yeah. Yeah, they are, and, and there are a lot of Christians that aren't. I may be unlovable to you, but you better you better not feel that way about me. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Darwin. It, it, it's the kind of love that that God has for us, it, and it's so hard sometimes for us to understand and grasp that that He loves us enough that He never gave up on us. I mean, think about this. Since, since Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the book of Revelation, it's His love for us when we mess up, when we fail Him, when we sin. Yeah. Yeah, it, we, can, we, we can change their heart, hopefully, huh? Thank you. That's right. Um, there's no middle ground here. On one side is God, on the other side is the world. On one side is life, on the other side is what? Death. On one side is love, and on the other side is hate. No middle ground. To, so verse 10, the one who loves his brother abides in the light now we're talking about agape love. The love God has for us that he would send his only son from heaven to live on this earth, be an example for us to die a death that we can't even fathom. Be buried in a borrowed tomb, raised from the dead to the glory of the Father. So verse 10, he said, the one who loves his brother abides in that light. There's no cause for stumbling in him because we're walking in the light. If we're walking in the darkness, we can stumble. What's the matter? What'd I do? Nothing. Oh, oh you did? <laughs> it wasn't me then. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we do, don't we? So we won't be a stumbling block. Yeah, for others. Yeah, thank you very much. Huh? It's hard. <laughs> That's hard. We have to work on that, don't we? Every day. I mean, every day we have to work on it. To abide in the light means more than just this occasional action in our life. It's an everyday working hard at it. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ because we want to remain in the light. All right, we're to make this our goal. This is to be, <clears throat> like Marcia said, this is to be part of our life. When we do, there's no occasion for us to stumble because we got the light and we can see where we're going. 
uh, those who walk in the light of Jesus Christ abide in His truth, and we're protected from the snares and the pitfalls and the troubles that come along in our life each day. Verse 11, But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. My goodness. So here are three conditions. When you hate your brother and sister in Christ, you walk in darkness, your eyes are blind, and you don't know where you're going. In other words, you are lost if you don't know where you're going. So if we're walking in darkness, it, and we're talking about our inner condition, aren't we? We're not talking about our physical condition. We're talking about the inner condition of us, our soul, our spirit. It, it's the inner condition, and the inner condition of us, if it's in darkness, then it's going to show on the outside that we're walking in darkness. In other words, we've lost our sense of direction. Well, I remember in the Army, before they got all those new techniques and GPS, and some of us have, have, have this experience. You give you a compass, they take you out in the middle of nowhere, and you got to find the other place in the middle of nowhere, and you only got so long to get there, so you got to know how to read your compass. You know, you have to know how. You have to know how to pace yourself and where to walk in an asthma. That's the Word of God. This is our asthma. This teaches us to pace ourselves. This teaches us to stay on course, doesn't it? It teaches us to reach the goal where we want to be. I just made that up. That's not bad. <laughs> but all of that's the truth about the army, and it's the truth about God. It's blinded their eyes. So there's three conditions of, that is a result of hating your brother and sister in Christ. You're walking in darkness. Your eyes are blind, and you don't know where you're going. You're lost. Now, if we're walking in darkness, it's the inner condition of us. And it's also outward by the life we live. We've lost our sense of direction. Because the way of sin, I'm telling you that we need to realize, I need to realize that the way of sin is the way of darkness. It's the way of dark. I, I, I got a good example. I, I, how many of you been to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky? Just me and Beverly, huh? Yeah. You go in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, boy, I don't like caves. They scare me. Because when they turn out that flashlight as an example, and you can't even see your hand, front of your face. Of course, that's what I'm going to talk about this morning in the lesson, but I'm not going to mention Mammoth Cave. But uh, it applies here. In Mammoth Cave, there are these fish and these insects. What do you think they have different from us? Living in total darkness, you can't see your hand front of your face. What? Huh? They, got, they, they must have radar because they have no eyes. They have eyes, I guess, but they, they can't see. They've had to do that. They've had to adjust through the centuries. And so they're in this cave, and these insects and these fish, and they have no eyes that can see. Their sight is long gone, <laughs> and they're in total darkness. And it, it's a condition that's caused when we sin, when we live a life of sin. We become blinded, and we can't see, and we're walking in darkness. It's a condition in life. You know what that is? That's fatal, isn't it? It's fatal. It's fatal in our life, in our soul. It's fatal. It, 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 you get to a point in your life that you're blinded, just like those fish in Mammoth Cave. Second Corinthians chapter 4, look at that with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, begin at verse 3 and 4. Or 3 and verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing. In whose case, the God of this world, who is that? Who's the God of this world? Satan. In whose case, the God of this world, what has he done? He's blinded the minds of who? The unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of who? God. Amazing, isn't it? So if, if we lack grace, and if we lack love, or the grace of love, you could say, then we're deficient in all other Christian virtues. All the rest of them. Let's go. I was going to quit. But let's go just a little bit further. Let's wait till they start walking in. In verses 12 through 14, John addresses little children, young men, and fathers. In other words, he's relating a family life of children, young children, or little children, young men, and fathers in our, in our walk as a Christian. It's really amazing. He says, I, had, I write or I have written. And in both of these instances, it's the same. These three groups are all Christians. All Christians. So children, what are they? What are children? They're new Christians. New Christians. New Christians. What are young men? Those that are mature in Christ. And what about fathers? They've been Christians the longest. And that's why I, I want you to look at this. Verse 12. I am writing to you little children, brand new Christians, because your sins have been forgiven you for His name's sake. So these new Christians have obeyed the gospel. Their sin has been forgiven. It was for His name's sake. For God the Father, He forgives us through Jesus Christ. And we come to the Father through Jesus Christ. Remember in verse 1, he says, we, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's through the name of Christ that we approach the Father. John, 6, John 14 and verse 6. I see. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through or by me. Acts 4 and verse 12 tells us, and, there's no, and there is salvation in no one else. For no under, name under heaven has been given among men by which we must be saved. Isn't that amazing? I tell you, the love that he has for us. Let me do verse 13 and 14 and we'll quit. After we mention a few things. I am writing to you, fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, he says, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So we see that all in the life of a, of a Christian, don't we? John first talks to the mature, mature Christian. You, you, you've been faithful disciples of the Lord. You've known Him from the beginning. You've matured in the Lord. It's, you're full of experience. And he talks to young men or those younger. They, they are in the process of maturing in Christ. They have overcome Satan in their lives. They're not perfect. Neither are we. But we're walking in the light. We're, we're remaining steadfast to Him. We're strong in the Word. 
that abides, we abide in the Word. Uh, then he talks to little children, new Christians who obeyed the gospel. They've come to know God because they've been forgiven of their sins. They know God and they're walking in the light. What is the Apostle John known as? What do we people know him as? The Apostle of Love. Isn't that amazing? And he is. He is the Apostle of Love. We'll pick it up at verse 15 next time. front of your face because that's what I'm going to talk about this morning in the lesson but I'm not going to mention Mammoth Cave but uh, it applies here in Mammoth Cave there are these fish and these insects what do you think they have different from us living in total darkness you can't see your hand front of your face what huh they got they, they must have radar because they have no eyes they have eyes, I guess, but they, they can't see. They've had to do that. They've had to adjust through the centuries. And so they're in this cave and these insects and these fish and they have no eyes that can see. Their sight is long gone. <laughs> and they're in total darkness. And it, it's a condition that's caused when we sin, when we live a life of sin we become blinded and we can't see and we're walking in darkness. It's a condition in life. You know what that is? That's fatal, isn't it? That's fatal. It's fatal in our life. In our soul, it's fatal. It, 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 you get to a point in your life that you're blinded just like those fish in Mammoth Cave. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Look at that with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, begin at verse 3 and 4. Or 3 and verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing. In whose case... The God of this world, who is that? Who's the God of this world? Satan. In whose case the God of this world, what has he done? He's blinded the minds of who? The unbelieving. So that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is in the image of who? God. Amazing, isn't it? So if, if we lack grace and if we lack love or the grace of love, you could say, then we're deficient in all other Christian virtues. All the rest of them. Let's go. I, I was going to quit. But let's go just a little bit further. Let's wait till they start walking in. In verses 12 through 14, John addresses little children, young men, and fathers. In other words, he's relating a family life of children, young children, or little children, young men, and fathers in our, in our walk as a Christian. It's really amazing. He says, I, had, I write or I have written in, in both of these instances, it's the same. These three groups are all Christians. All Christians. So children, what are they? What are children? They're new Christians. New Christians. New Christians. What are young men? Those that are mature in Christ. And what about fathers? They've been Christians the longest. And that's why I, I want you to look at this. Verse 12. I am writing to you little children, brand new Christians, because your sins have been forgiven you for His name's sake. So these new Christians have obeyed the gospel. Their sin has been forgiven. It was for His name's sake. 
for God the Father. He forgives us through Jesus Christ. And we come to the Father through Jesus Christ. Remember in verse 1, he says, we, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's through the name of Christ that we approach the Father. John, 6, John 14 and verse 6. I see. I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through or by me. Acts 4 and verse 12 tells us, and, there's no, and there is salvation in no one else. For no under, name under heaven has been given among men by which we must be saved. Isn't that amazing? I tell you, the love that he has for us. Let me do verse 13 and 14 and we'll quit. After we mention a few things. I am writing to you, fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the Father. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men, he says, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So we see that all in the life of a, of a Christian, don't we? John first talks to the mature, mature Christian. You, you, you've been faithful disciples of the Lord. You've known him from the beginning. You've matured in the Lord. It's, you're full of experience. And he talks to young men or those younger, they, they are in the process of maturing in Christ. They have overcome Satan in their lives. They're not perfect. Neither are we, but we're walking in the light. We're, we're remaining steadfast to Him. We're strong in the Word that abides. We abide in the Word. Uh, then He talks to little children, new Christians who have obeyed the gospel. They've come to know God because they've been forgiven of their sins. They know God and they're walking in the light. What is the Apostle John known as? What do we people know him as? The apostle of love. Isn't that amazing? And he is. He is the apostle of love. We'll pick it up at verse 15 next time. <laughs>